let's look at the remainder of the amendments. We've looked at most of the Bill of Rights. The Ninth and the Tenth Amendment are still part of the Bill of Rights. They don't specifically give any individual right like the rest of them do. Uh, the Ninth Amendment says, The enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others. It means, well, essentially what it means is that we are not limited to, to just those rights that are written in the Bill of Rights. Let me just give you one example. Nowhere does the Constitution say that we are guaranteed the right to bear arms. It's not found within the Bill of Rights. But we have the right to do that. And, and the Supreme Court has ruled that, that marriage is legal. And, you know, they, they've made rulings on same-sex marriage, on interracial marriage, on things that the states had made illegal over at different times in our history. Um, and well, how can they do this? Well, it says that we have other rights that aren't listed within the Constitution, and we're not just limited to those rights that are there. It's kind of a, a catch-all saying, you know, there's other things that we can do, even though it's specifically stated. The Tenth Amendment, I'm not going to really spend any time on because that's federalism. We talked about that early on in this class, and that's the one that says that any power not specifically given to the federal government and then is reserved for the state. So that's our concept of federalism, which we studied in depth in the first unit. The rest of the amendments, uh, 11 through 27, came in one at a time throughout history um, different for different reasons. Um, some were events, some were just changes in our thoughts, uh, some were just clearing up some things um, that weren't working as well as we had hoped. Um, rather than go in order, I grouped them by, you know, topic. So let's start with the voting amendments, 15, 19, 24, and 26. And let's start with the hardest one, and, and that's the 15th Amendment. There were three amendments that came after the Civil War. The Civil War ended in... 1865, and then we had three amendments, and one of them dealt with voting, and one of those amendments was, uh, it says that voting can't be denied because of race or color or color or previous condition of servitude, which would have been slavery. Sometimes people say, well, this gave African Americans the right to vote, and that is not really a correct statement. What it said was, you can't be denied the right to vote because of your race, but unfortunately, states figured out other ways to deny African Americans the right to vote. Uh, they passed grandfather clauses. Now, a grandfather clause was a, a clause that said, well, you can't vote if your grandfather couldn't vote. Well, if you were a slave, now a freeman, um, obviously your grandfather couldn't have voted. They were either a slave or that they weren't even in the United States. So then you couldn't vote. But what it could do is eliminate any African Americans from their children ever voting because, well, you can't vote and your grandkids can't vote and, and so on. This could go on forever. Uh, states pass. Literacy tests, well, um, sl it was illegal in southern states to um, educate slaves. Well, now when the slaves were free, they were uneducated um, and, and illiterate, so they weren't going to pass a literacy test. They paid poll taxes, which you'd have to pay to uh, vote. Um, former slaves were some of the poorest people uh, during that time. So states passed lots of different things that denied African Americans a right to vote. Um, the Fifteenth Amendment also said that Congress has a power to for enforce this through appropriate laws, and eventually they did, but not for almost a hundred years. We've studied the Civil Rights Movement, or at least you have in American history. The Civil Rights Movement was really about getting a, vo a vote, a, a, a you know, a place at the table of American democracy. And if you deny people the right to vote, you're denying them any say at all within a democracy. Uh, how can you get change if you can't vote people into office who will support you? So you cannot stress enough the importance of voting in a democracy. And when we limited voting to just a certain group of people, we're saying that group of people really controls everything. Well, that's not a democracy, and that's not how our system should work. So 
states couldn't deny African Americans the right to vote because of their race, but they found other ways to deny people the right to vote. That changed with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You could make an argument that this is the most important law in American history. Um, there's other important ones too, but certainly this one should go up there. And the Voting Rights Act eliminated the rest of those things that were in place. Now, some of those things, like grandfather clauses or whatever, had been in place, but had either been struck unconstitutional or so on. The 24th Amendment that came a year before the, the Voting Rights Act uh, eliminated poll taxes, said that the states can't use poll taxes, um, which kept the poorer people from voting, not just African Americans by 1964, but anybody who didn't have enough money. The Supreme Court or the, the Constitution uh, was changed to say that poll taxes were illegal. And then going back to here, whoops, excuse me, going the wrong way here, going back um, to the Voting Rights Act. That, had, that eliminated anything else. So the process of African Americans getting the right to vote began in 1870, but it really didn't end until 1965 when African Americans were truly allowed to vote. The rest of the voting amendments are pretty simple. The 19th Amendment, very important amendment, said that states can't deny someone the right to vote because of their, of their gender, because of their sex. And there wasn't any grandmother clauses or anything like that. So when the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, women were given the right to vote. It doubled our, our voting population. In 1971, we passed the 26th Amendment that changed the voting age to 18. There's always a little history behind these, uh, and I don't get into them too much, but uh, I want to at least sometimes talk about them so we understand, like, why. Well, this was in the midst of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War um, was in the United States from, from 1965 to 1973, and the draft was going on. Well, 18, 19, 20-year-olds were being drafted in the service. They were asked to fight and die for their country, yet they weren't even allowed to vote for, you know, the members of Congress and the president who were sending them off to vote and die for their country. And this just seemed fundamentally wrong. So the vote, to, the voting age was changed to 18 uh, because of that. These amendments all deal with the executive branch. And most of these we've already talked about when we studied the president. We, we may not have, I may not have mentioned which amendment it came from, but we've talked about these. So some of these will be somewhat review. The 12th Amendment just cleared up some questions with the Electoral College, and that's all you need to know about the 12th Amendment. I will go a little more with it, but you don't need to, you know, really know this. Um, previously, uh, the way our Constitution was originally written, that whoever got the most, the, the, the majority of electoral votes was president, the second most electoral votes was vice president. Well, that didn't seem to work. It didn't take long before we realized, well, maybe that's not the best thing where political opponents now have to be uh, work together. Uh, so they changed that. It used to be um, if nobody got a majority of electoral votes, they took the five top vote getters uh, and then the House chose from them. This changed it to the top three. Again, nothing exceptionally important. But nonetheless, that's what the 12th Amendment did. The 22nd Amendment, which was passed in 1951, set the term limits for the president. And again, we've talked about this before when we studied uh, um, you know, the president himself. Uh, it used to be you could be elected unlimited times. The only president that was elected more than once was Franklin Roosevelt, um, 32, 36, 40, and 44. And then he died in 1945. And, during his last term, and notice in 1951 is when we changed the Constitution saying that two, uh, two times, two terms is as much as you can get. 23rd Amendment, 1961, uh, gave Washington, D.C. three electoral votes. Uh, previously, um, because Washington, D.C. was not a state, they didn't get any electoral votes. Well, the population of Washington, D.C., was very similar to some of us smaller states like South Dakota and Wyoming and Montana and so on. And uh, it just seemed wrong that those people couldn't vote for president. The 25th Amendment we've talked about a little bit too, a little more complicated, 
um, but it clears up some questions with presidential succession. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. Um, president Johnson was his vice president, so then he took over as president. But but uh, um, Lyndon Johnson did not have a vice president at first. He didn't have a vice president until he was elected, you know, at the end of Kennedy's term, then he ran for election, was elected again. But for for a couple of years there, there was no vice president because there was nothing in the Constitution that stated how you would get a vice president. Well, this cleared it up. It said that um, the vice president the new president must appoint a new vice president. Um, that way, if Johnson would have died too, then there would have been somebody to fill that spot. It also um, came up with some some what ifs, uh, solved some what ifs. Like, what if Kennedy would have survived but was was brain dead? What would we do then? You know, obviously, if Kennedy died, then the vice president takes over. But what if the president uh, survived but could no longer function as a president? Well, it uh, came up with some. Uh, of how we would fill that particular thing. So, you know, if Congress and or, or the, the vice president and cabinet can write a, a letter to Congress asking power to be transferred over to the vice president. Uh, so it kind of filled up some of those questions that we have on what if, and that's what the 25th Amendment did. Three amendments are specific with Congress. The 17th Amendment is probably one of the most important ones. Previously, uh, we didn't elect senators. The Constitution said that senators were appointed by state legislatures. That changed with the 17th Amendment. The 17th Amendment um, said that we will now elect senators through popular vote, you know, which is what we do now. So we have a more direct say in government. We vote for our members of the House. We directly vote for our members of the Senate now, too. There still is the Electoral College for President, but uh, we do have more say, especially in our legislative branch, than we did before. The 20th Amendment uh, is, is to shorten up the time between elections and when elected officials actually take office. It used to be that elections were in November, they still are, early November, and then the elected officials didn't take office until it was March, and mid to late March is what it was. So that time between they, their election, winning the election, and they took office, well, the, the previously elected official was then still in office, but it's not much got done. They're, they're known as lame duck candidates or, or a lame duck session because why pass new legislation when some members are going to be out of office in, in March? We already know they're out. They just are filling the rest of their term. You know, what's the point of that? Same thing with the president. We have an election in November. Let's just let's use that as an example. Let's say that, that Joe Biden beats uh, President Trump in November. But if if Biden doesn't take office until March, President Trump would still be the president until March. And do you want to do a whole lot when you have someone who will not be president in in you know in a few months? This didn't change that. That we still have that lame duck period, but it changed it made it shorter. So what it did was it changed the lame duck period from March to January. So Congress takes office on January 3rd. The president uh, takes office on January 20th. So it, it didn't eliminate that lame duck period, as we call it, but it shortened it. Uh, also said that what, what, if, what if, let's say, Joe Biden wins the election, uh, but um, between November and January, he dies. What happens then? We don't have a president or a vice president then. Well, it said, well, okay, well, the, the elected vice president would take office. 27th Amendment um, 
dealt with congressional raises. If Congress gives themselves a raise, they don't get that raise until the next congressional election. So if we don't like the fact that they gave themselves a raise, we can vote them out of office and, and, and those people won't get that particular raise. The rest of the amendments um, don't necessarily fit in a group. They're kind of separate. And most of these are pretty simple. The 11th Amendment, I don't care if you know it all, uh, it deals with lawsuits. If a foreign country is going to sue a state, it's, it's handled in state court, uh, not federal court. If they're going to sue a citizen, it's handled in state court, not federal court. Not an exceptionally important amendment here. 13th Amendment is very, very important, but it's also very simple to talk about. Uh, this is one of the three that came after the um, Civil War, and the 13th Amendment ended slavery. Uh, a lot of people think that, well, didn't the Emancipation Proclamation end slavery? Well, no, it didn't. What the Emancipation Proclamation did was it said that, that slaves were free in states that were in open rebellion against the United States. Well, what happens if the war ends then, and those states are no longer in open rebellion. Could slavery then go again? And what about the, the, there were three, we call them border states, that were slave states that did not participate in the Confederacy. Slavery didn't end in those places either. But the 13th Amendment cleared up any issue. Slavery is illegal in the United States. The 14th Amendment dealt with a number of things, some not as important as others, but there's a couple things in the 14th Amendment that are pretty important. Um, one thing it said was, if you're born in the United States, you are automatically an American citizen. Now, this was put in to prevent states from denying former slaves citizenship. This is another one that came right after the Civil War, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Uh, all came right after the Civil War. So they said, wait, if you were born in the United States, so if you were a slave that was born in South Carolina, uh, now that you're a free slave, you are an American citizen because you were born in the United States. At the point in history, he, when, when the Civil War began, the only slaves in the United States were domestically born slaves because the importation of slaves had been illegal for a long time. So this gave citizenship to former slaves, but it still applies today. When we look at, you know, let's say that someone comes to the United States illegally and then has a child, that child is automatically an American citizen. Some people say, well, that doesn't make sense. Why? If their parent was an illegal, illegally here, why would their child be an American citizen? Well, because of the 14th Amendment. You know, uh, we would have to change the 14th Amendment, uh, make a new amendment to alter the, the 14th Amendment to, to change that. So that still applies today, even though. The intention was for slaves because it's in the Constitution. It applies to anybody. Uh, some debt, you don't have to worry about that. But more importantly, it applied the Bill of Rights to the states. Prior to the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights protect us, protected the citizens from the federal government doing stuff. The federal government taking away your uh, right of free speech or your right of a fair trial or so on. But it didn't apply to the states. The 14th Amendment made it so neither the federal government nor the state government can violate any of our first or, or second or third or any of our, our constitutionally protected rights. The 16th Amendment allowed Congress to pass an income tax. The Supreme Court had declared an income tax unconstitutional. So to override the Supreme Court's ruling, we had to pass a constitutional amendment specifically giving Congress the power to pass an income tax. Congress had the power to tax, but for whatever reason, the Supreme Court ruled that an income tax was not in their power. Well, it is now because of the 16th Amendment. The 18th Amendment uh, is prohibition. It made um, the, the making, selling, and consumption of alcohol illegal in the United States. That was repealed, but because it was in the Constitution, the only way to change it is a new constitutional amendment, so that's the 21st Amendment. The 21st Amendment uh, repealed the 18th Amendment. 
if it would have been a law, then a new law could have done, could have you know you could eliminate it with a law. But because it was a constitutional amendment, uh, prohibition was it took another constitutional amendment to change that to eliminate it, and that uh, is the rest of those con of the constitutional amendments. So at this point, we've studied everything in the Constitution from the preamble, the very beginning, and then through every single uh, amendment in the Constitution. So you have at least been introduced to, in one fashion or another, the entire Constitution over this semester.